Hi people, I'm Igor, this is Tomo, and our topic will be from zero to test automation in product company. So just to give you a disclaimer, this is not us showing you the ideal solution that you can just copy paste. This is us sharing the experience and the journey we face. So the idea is to exchange some feedback and to exchange some knowledge. Uh, so first, let's start with introduction. I have around nine years of experience as a, as a QA. Uh, I've been working in product companies, uh, in agency, and in gaming company. And my passions are creating testing processes and uh, optimizing them, but also exploring tools for automation and manual testing. Tomo, you can... Yeah, also. so as Zigor said, my name is Tomislav. Um, I have around four years of experience in test automation, mostly doing web, now mobile automation. Uh, so I've mostly worked with agencies, uh, Porsche is my uh, first product company and you know I'm passionate about you know making these custom uh, test automation solutions to you know optimize the testing process and we'll mention some of them in the presentation right? okay so let's start with agenda so first I will talk about context who we are what we do and what issues did we face on our journey uh, then Tomo will uh, dive deep in the tech deep dive uh, with mobile automation, backend testing, and IoT integration topic. And then we'll, we'll land on some conclusion. Uh, so basically, uh, what is Porsche e-bike? Uh, Porsche e-bike was founded in 2021 when Porsche acquired Grey Bikes and uh, Fatsua, which is a German company that produces components for e-bike industry. Uh, the goal of Porsche company is basically just to produce components for e-bike industry, so not the whole bike. So we won't have like Porsche bike selling. Uh, we are currently in the phase of research and development, so we didn't release the product yet. Uh, and basically to give you a bit of context uh, with some e-bike crash course, uh, what does an e-bike consist of? Some, on the right side, there are some obvious components, uh, which are hardware components. Each e-bike needs to have a motor that helps you spin the pedals, battery that charges motor, and some kind of VCU or bike computer that acts as a brain unit uh, to coordinate between those two. But also you can uh, adjust your ride modes, you can uh, check your battery level speed and stuff. Uh, what is a bit uh, less visible are software components, uh, mostly backend, and uh, then we have mobile application that just extends the features of an e-bike. And uh, I would like to focus more on these digital components because Tomislav and I are working in a digital system. So basically we are testing backend and mobile apps. So how does this system work on higher level? Uh, so each e-bike has connectivity. So in this bike computer, you have e-SIM card that provides constant connectivity to the internet. That means that bike can like send telemetry and real data to the backend. But also from the another side, it provides connectivity to mobile devices, so mobile app. So it can connect to mobile app and then send data there. Uh, backend is kind of our hub for data, so it processes the data, provides some metrics, provides, uh, provides X some somehow a source of truth. Um, and mobile, mobile devices, basically mobile apps, uh, have regular connection with backend, but also provide some IoT integration with uh, an e-bike. Um, so what challenges did we face like on our journey uh, automating back and then mobile app uh, basically we needed to build, build automation from zero because, because uh, grape before was a startup so now we have a bit of different technologies and a bit of different processes uh, we could use best practices from our colleagues we could use our knowledge but we still needed to learn a lot of stuff on the way uh, we needed to pick uh, UI automation infrastructure. We, we uh, investigated a few approaches that Tomo will talk about. And also we had the challenges with IoT integration because we do not have like uh, final hardware. Hardware is in development, so we needed to figure out how we would test with hardware in development. Uh, also the last point is automation of backend, but in gRPC standard. So REST is uh, like supported everywhere, but gRPC kind of uh, lacks tools for automating it. Uh, that's all for me, Tomo, you can. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, so first of all, in order to establish automation on our project, we needed to understand what we needed to automate, right? 
So there are a few systems uh, that we needed to take into account. First of them is our application, which consists of the client side, which we'll cover in mobile automation or with UI testing. Then we have our backend, which we'll cover with API automation. And the, as uh, Igor said, our hardware under development, which in this case is going to be the vehicle control unit for the VCU, which we're going to cover with some kind of IoT integration testing, right? Uh, what's important is uh, that the mobile uh, front-end and back-end communicate using uh, REST and gRPC. We're going to be specifically here concentrating on gRPC and for the uh, VCU integration. So the VCU communicates with the mobile app using uh, Bluetooth, right? So we're going to be testing the Bluetooth connectivity, right? Um, now, uh, after we've established what we need to automate, now we uh, need to establish how we need to uh, automate it, right? And here we had a couple of possible solutions. For the mobile automations, uh, automation, I'm going to go through infrastructure solutions because we already established a framework using Appium and Python. And here we had a, um, two different solutions in mind. One, one of them was Headspin, a third party solution. Uh, the other one was an in house solution or the solution we went with, it, which is the device farm. For the backend automation and the gRPC, I'm going to mention Postman and the Python gRPC tools. And for the Bluetooth uh, integration, uh, we had a clear cut uh, decision here, which was the Bluetooth simulator, right? So uh, now let's switch to the criteria that we used for judging all of these solutions. So the criteria was obviously cost, right? Reliability, complexity, uh, customizability, performance. And for the mobile and IoT part, we also took into account the Bluetooth connectivity, right? Of course, I'm not going to cover every criteria for every tool, not only the ones that impacted our decision, right? So uh, I'm going to start with the mobile automation. Uh, I'm going to start with Headspin. Uh, why? Because we wanted to use Headspin, as everybody does with third-party uh, platforms, to eliminate our need to build and uh, main maintain any device infrastructure or infrastructure as such, right? We just wanted to run our tests on somebody's infrastructure and get back the data, right? And that's what has been offered us. It had seamless uh, integration with our framework. We could just run the scripts, get the, get the test results back. It even has performance testing integration if you wanted to do it in the future. Uh, and test case management, so you can arrange everything in test suites, execute them, arrange and get, get in-depth te test reports. And it even had like an AI-based issue detection engine because that's a key phrase. Um, uh, and it said, in their documentation that it can like do a triage on, on where the root cause is coming from. Is it the network issues, device issues, or is it even architectural flaws, right? And uh, of course, the most important part for us is offered real devices, right? Uh, but uh, although it's like a good solution for most testing needs, uh, there were some cons. Uh, first of all, we could not test Bluetooth connectivity at all, right? Not even mock it or anything. Um, because it didn't have, they didn't have any support for it. And of, all, of course, we have the devices, we can't give them like to them in the UK or somewhere in India, I don't know where, right? And the closest server was in the UK uh, that we had access to, and just it, it uh, gave us latency issues with made, which made the tests flaky, and it, they, it just gave us additional complexity, right? And the costs were high, high enough that it made more sense financially for us to establish our own infrastructure and maintain it in the long term, right? Uh, and uh, that's why we chose to go in a different way. We chose to build our own device farm. And so just a disclaimer, this is not like a textbook definition of a device farm. This is just my view on the concept. And so as you can see, device farm is a collection of physical devices such as smartphones, tablets, or other hardware uh, and virtual and or virtual devices because we'll also be using simulators, emulators, and so on, right? And they're connected to a central system, a typical PC or a server. In this case, it's this happy little PC, right? And it allows testing software across multiple devices simultaneously, right? So what, what happens, we have like this central PC that's just uh, uh, doing the execution of the code, right? And it sends the commands to the individual devices and then collects the results or feedback on those devices and gives us the feedback in the form of, let's say, a test report, right? And um, the pros and cons of such a device car, farm are, for starters, that it's highly performant because it's literally in the room with us, right? So there's no uh, latency. Uh, it gives us the ability to do, you know, simultaneous testing across various devices with minimal delays or bottlenecks, right? Due to network issues. 
uh, it has a flexible configuration. So we are the ones who decide which features go in, which features go out, right? And um, the Bluetooth connectivity, right? So we can uh, test the Bluetooth connecti connectivity using Bluetooth adapters and our Bluetooth simulator um, uh, library, right? That I'm going to be talking about later on. Uh, but of course, there are some cons to this. Uh, you have to first invest in all of those devices. You have to buy the, the, the PC, the mobile devices, connect them. You have to also uh, do some networking, right? To make them remotely, remotely accessible, right? And so on. And uh, I, I would say the biggest con for us, the workers, is the device management, right? You have to uh, monitor each device in order not to get any battery failures. It has to be constantly updated that it's on the right version of the OS and so on. And they have to be also maintained, right? Um, and uh, so before I, oh, sorry. So before, uh, this is going to be all for the mobile automation. I'm going to switch to the backend automation. And before that, I'd like to see a show of hands who here has worked with gRPC or knows what gRPC is? Okay, makes sense, I mean, but okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to do a quick intro to gRPC, which as you see is a Google remote procedure call, so that's why Nico was the only one with the hand up. And I'm going to compare it with a more maybe uh, familiar technology, which is REST, right? <laughs> so uh, the differences are that gRPC uses the binary format, and this, um, enables it to be faster and have, and have smaller payloads, right? While REST is using JSON XML, which is, of course, more human readable, but as the payload is, is bigger and, and slower. And also, uh, gRPC uses, the, uses HTTP2, while REST uses HTTP 1.1. What does that mean? It means that it supports multiplexing. And multiplexing is a technique where you have a... Um, which enables a signal or um, which enables a, a data stream uh, that can be um, sent to multiple signals or data, data streams that can be sent to a single connection, right, or a channel at the same time without them interfering with, it, with each other. So it's so something like um, streaming and bidirectional communication, right, uh, which I've also mentioned there, like the full duplex streaming, right, client servers can send multiple messages at the same time, while REST has stateless communication, right? You're just sending a, a request and you're expecting a response, right? And uh, something that is also going to be important later on are the st strongly typed contracts, which uh, gRPC defines in proto files, right? While uh, REST is more flexible with looser contracts, but I'm going to go come to that in a, another example of the tools right, that we chose. Uh, so for the tools, uh, for starters, I'm going to go to mention Postman. So Postman, I think, is a well-known tool. It has a familiar GUI, right, that everybody uses. And uh, also our team had existing REST tests written in Postman, so it would be much easier for them to continue with uh, gRPC, right? Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Postman, as well as many other tools, has limited support for gRPC testing. Uh, normally, Postman has these collections, and they have a collection runner. This can be integrated into the pipeline and then, you know, automatically execute it. But this does not exist for gRPC for now. Maybe they will integrate it in, in a future, um, future time. And of course, Postman is also a paid solution. And that's why we decided to do something again in-house. And you see Postman is not so very happy about it. Um, and we decided to go with Python gRPC tools. Uh, the name of the library, if you wanted to know it, is gRPC.io. And the main ingredient is this uh, protocol buffer compiler or the proto C comp compiler. Now to go back to the uh, strongly defined contracts, right? Uh, you can see here an example of a proto file. You see the service tweeter, right? Which has a, uh, the name of the method, the RPC method, uh, the, me the request and the response. And this proto file can be used with, with virtually any language. I mean, there are some that are not supported, but all the popular ones are supported, but it needs to be compiled. Uh, now, to for the strongly type for the, for the strong contract, uh, the issue is that if you can see for the request, right, you have a data type here that's string, right, and if you were to change, uh, if you were to send, let's say, an integer in the place of a string, you could not even send the message. You would get the compilation error, right, uh, versus the re versus rest where you could send it, right, it would be sent, but you would get like an error that that that's not in the right data type or so on, right. So that's why it's why they have st strong contracts because you cannot change the data type at all, right? 
Um, and uh, what you need to do to uh, leverage this is that you need to compile it into something that your programming language or ID can understand. And that's where this uh, protocol buffer compiler comes in. And he compiles this uh, proto file into, uh, as, I, as you can see the example for Python, into Python readable files. And you can then leverage them, create a client, or uh, as they, I think in protobuf terms it's called a stub, which then can communicate with the server and you can integrate it into your tests, right? And if anybody wants to know more, here's the link to the um, quick start for Python, but it supports in most of the popular <coughs> languages, right? Uh, so this is this is going to be it for the uh, backend automation. Uh, now we have the last part, uh, which is going to be the Bluetooth simulator. So of course, for now the devices, the VCU is not readily available for for us. We cannot just take it and you know automate on it because multiple teams are working on it. Uh, we've uh, chosen to go with the in-house uh, Bluetooth testing library and simulator that was developed by our uh, embedded software testing team. And it enables us to test the Bluetooth connectivity. So the pairing, the bonding, the streaming, as uh, Igor mentioned, because the VCU is sending us data such as uh, speed, cadence, uh, time of the ride, and so on, right? So we can mock everything with this library. And what it does, it uh, leverages a uh, adapter. It can be the adapter of the device itself, right? Or maybe a bot adapter from the store. And it, si and it makes it, uh, it simulates it into a Bluetooth peripheral device that you can then later connect to and um, confirm that everything, you know, is working well, that you can, uh, that you can pair, pair to it, stay bonded and um, get the data, get the data that you need, right? So uh, to sum up, uh, so we've went through several conclusions, and due to the needs of customization and uh, Bluetooth connectivity, we've, we've gone with the device farm. Uh, we've chosen the Python gRPC tools due to the lack of automation support from uh, Postman, and the Bluetooth simulator was really the only clear-cut option for us, and because we don't have real, really available um, devices at, at, at any time, right? So it was the only real option, right? And yeah, that's... That's it. Thank you. You really were serious when you said you will be on time. <laughs> uh, any questions? When do you plan to introduce UX into the whole process? Well, UX for now is uh, on the manual testing side. Oh yeah, can you rephrase, like, what do you think by UX? Uh, like, m more research, user testing, and more, like, cases, and how the UI will look like in the end. Uh, but this uh, research with users is usually done by designers, so they are doing, like, A-B testing and trying different solutions. Mm -hmm. So, I think they are already doing that, so, ah, while no. designing the app, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how to kind of put that in a concrete question, but you have a hardware on one side, um, all data that is important to, to, to for, for the for, for flow, uh, it's very dependable by that hardware. Uh -huh. uh, is that like OEM pieces or uh, in the group those things are, are, are created like from where you, you, you pull data that you will show in uh -huh. the in the, in the different flows and uh, over uh, protocol and everything. Okay, so let me, let me try to understand the question. You mean like uh, how do we manage the data we get from the hardware? Or uh, would they, would they like first, it? do you have a good data from hardware? Mm -hmm. uh, is that something where, I'm not sure you can probably influence with that, you have the, the finished piece. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is because it's still under development, right? Mm -hmm. We have for now the data that we need for the application function. Of course, it sends a lot of other data that it's not going, maybe it's not covered by the application solely, right? So for now, yes, we have the data that we need, right? But the data itself, of course, is, uh, is the responsibility of multiple teams, so we, it's something that we need to work on together, right? So any kind of logs, metrics, those things you can consume from 
most of the hardware in the right way? Well, uh, the thing is, we do not really care about logs uh, for this for this part uh, because the hardware testing itself is done by the by another team, right? Mm -hmm. We're just concerned that we are getting the right data, right? Mm -hmm. The yeah. data that we need. So all the noise kind of big yeah, 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 because. The, uh, another thing, the embedded software team is, is testing the hardware itself if it's functioning correctly or if, if there's some errors going on. Right? Yeah, we are testing on a product level. So we want to kind of have the mock that sends the data to the application and verify that application works okay. So whole system, we have system level testing that will uh, like use the real bike and uh, like whole integration and stuff. Okay. Anyone else? once, <laughs> twice. Okay, sold. Uh, thank you, Ram. And given that we are definitely on time, uh, I think it's uh, it's fair from us to reward you with some uh, some food, some drinks. So uh, give a big round of applause for all of our presenters. Thank you.